but I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm riding around in Atlanta with Sab, cause that nigga been going harder than me. Let me start this off by saying that I do not hate it. So let me be clear, this isn't about me. I am just very, very, very disappointed by its anime adaptation. You guys wouldn't know this, but Tokyo Avengers is actually one of my favorite shows of the last couple years. Yeah, I know. Let me explain. Tokyo Avengers is a convoluted mess of a storyline with infuriating character writing, C-tier animation at best, especially for a shonen title. <gasps> Ew. Especially for as good of a story as it is sometimes. My legs. Huh? I can't. I can't feel my legs anymore, Takemichi. I can't move them. As well as another protagonist in the genre with time travel powers that has zero damn clue what to do with them. For anyone that doesn't know and is new to the story of Tokyo Avengers, our story is about our hero, Takamichi Hanagaki. But I'll be honest, that's really debatable. We follow him as he bumbles his ass through the internal affairs of the most well-known gang in Tokyo, known as Tokyo Manji or Toman. The reason he finds himself in this sea of unfortunate events in the fucking first place is due to the death of his ex-girlfriend by the hand of said gang that I just mentioned. One random day, he just falls on the train tracks only to be saved by a police officer nearby and revealing a sort of supernatural connection between him and the officer, who is apparently the brother brother of his deceased ex-girlfriend and he finds out that every time he makes contact with this brother he sends himself back time traveling 12 years into the past to his days as a middle school delinquent time travel see i know it's a lot just bear with me now off the cuff i'd say it's pretty easy to get invested into the story of tokyo avengers in season one our protagonist time travels back to the past to then realize he was never really about that gang shit in the first place but then he reunites with his middle school girlfriend hina tachibana which gives himself initiative to figure out the reasons for her death by the hands of the tokyo manji gang in the first place and how he can save her and when you read it on paper I'll be honest, despite all the bullshit, Tokyo Avengers is seriously a captivating story in season one. <laughs> While season two makes you realize you need five bulletin boards just to follow all the moving pieces, and if you've been on this channel for a while, you know how much I value good character writing over everything. I truly feel like whatever your overarching plot that you want your characters to get into should always be in service in the way your characters are structured in the first place and how you want to see them grow whether it's in a negative or positive way when i'm writing a story i usually have a rough outline of the plot and then i just spend the majority of the time working on the character writing and tokyo avengers despite having characters that i really enjoy the author really wants me to care about takamichi's mission more in season one rather than serious character progression for himself Besides like one or two characters, mostly everybody stays the same throughout season one and two. Most of the people in this show feel like plot devices or chess pieces that Takamichi is too stupid to figure out instead of actual meaningful characters to me. The only reason the show ever got on my radar was because it looked completely fresh. Just a normal high school sci-fi thriller. On presentation in season one, it felt like a really well thought out supernatural thriller about gang wars in Tokyo. Shit, I'm not even gonna lie. I was so immersed watching this show when it was first coming out. No way, this is. <laughs> hey, what the hell? He's lifting me up. Oh my! Oh my! Oh my god! Oh my fucking god! Holy shit! The narrative in season one stops anything that's going on in season two so far yeah i know it's not over we still gotta wait and see but i'm confident about my take now i know i said supernatural thriller but i meant supernatural very loosely takamichi really is the only one with powers in this story but he's so incompetent that you'd forget i mean i don't know i know i said most of these teenagers don't have powers but you're mine 
after watching some of the show back, I'm not too sure anymore. How the fuck did he not die? What the fuck? Now the main reasonings behind my disgust for the anime adaptation of Tokyo Avengers specifically is a pretty simple gripe. I think that shit looks ugly. Tokyo Avengers is animated by Leiden Films. The people behind uh, Kotaro Lives Alone. Who's, Who's watching, watching this? Insomniacs After School? Oh, Call of the Night, I know that one. Ah! So as you can see, Leiden Films is not the most high profile, renowned animation studio. Especially not known for its shonen. So when season one was airing, I didn't bat an eye too much at how bad the keyframe was in season one. And I only really started noticing it when season two came around because usually I'm like, if seasons go on, I feel like the animation quality should take a jump up. So while I was watching season two, I couldn't help but think, hmm, you know, there wasn't too much action going on this season. So why the fuck does this look so janky? I don't know. We'll let we'll let it slide this time they're probably saving the good shit for the second half of the season all right oh 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 no it's gonna look like this the whole time oh okay now look i have plenty of shows i love with mediocre or passable art styles and inconsistent animation quality tokyo avengers cinematography isn't the worst by far i just personally feel that tokyo avengers actually has a really dope premise for an anime shit for a tv show with so many cool and unique character designs that it is truly bogged down by the fact that the studio behind it does look like it's trying half the time I mean come on you decide to release the second half of your season the same time as Jujutsu Kaisen season 2 that was the plan not a great plan that's like asking if I want cup noodles or flaming young every week one is filling always gets the job done but the other is imbued with time compassion hair, blood, sweat, and tears, and looking at them side by side every week, a majority of people are gonna be like, yeah, why the fuck would I watch this? Oh man, oh man, this one's better than any fragrance in my collection for sure. Wow. I'm gonna go watch the show that looked like they actually tried. And that's the thing about Tokyo Avengers that really grinds my gears to the point I feel like it should be in the title. Tokyo Avengers. How to do the bare minimum. And this sucks. I don't want to talk honestly about the work of a bunch of underpaid and overworked key animators. But this is legit the main reason for me and why this show isn't as big as it can be. This show can't have two good consistent looking fight scenes to save its life. <laughs> The cinematography, composition, and colors of scenes feel so flat and lifeless compared to every other thing that's being put out right now. At least the big hitters. And for a story that's supposed to be suspenseful and thrilling no less. Y'all truly don't understand how big of a deal this is to me. Because like I said, I was ignoring all that shit in season one. Because I was so invested in the narrative, I didn't really care about the slideshow presentations that were being played on screen. So when I finally got to watch season 2 earlier this year, a season with a less compelling narrative, while I was watching I kept writing down how upset it made me that all the characters felt so stiff, almost like action figures. It's the reason why the final climax of the first half of this season is so underwhelming for me. For many, many different reasons that we'll get into later, obviously. It feels like this fight would have been so much cooler if A, the animators were allowed more time to work, or B, just give this title to a different studio to do the job better. Because as much as I don't want to put any more bags under the eyes of those poor animators at MAPPA Studios, you can't tell me the story of Tokyo Avengers isn't perfect 
for MAPPA Studios. MAPPA loves picking up titles with the same sort of aesthetic as Tokyo Avengers. Bloody, dramas, thrill ride like stories. There really is no other studio right now that I would have wanted to adapt to this series. But not right now though, let them... Let, let those guys get their rest. By their resume alone, these guys were never ever meant to pick up this title. And it frustrates me. I think that it's so sad that the best fight scene in the show, about teenage gang wars no less, where fights break out damn near every episode, is a 10 second sequence between Mikey and some randoms he beats up without even trying. <laughs> I got motion, not a dime shield corner. So cooking up in here, we're gonna chop y'all up. Look at all of this karate style. This is the best fight scene in the show, with over 30 episodes at this point. <sighs> Sidebar, the first ending song in season one is such a fucking bop. <laughs> I was listening to it the other day and I just felt so nostalgic hearing it. It's weird, the show only came out a couple years ago. I think it just reminded me of a time when I thought the show was actually good and not just entertaining dumb fun. Now that I personally got that off my chest, I think we need to talk about why I personally feel I'm drawn to this story. As well as why my entire race as a whole is so infatuated with this show. Like, come on, y'all. There are plenty of other cultures that like this show with prominent gang problems. Why are we the most vocal main enjoyers of this story? <laughs> I find that so funny. Now, don't click off the video. This is vital information to understand the appeal of Tokyo Avengers for me. We gotta get a little psychological. And we also gotta get a little racial. Niggers! You know all those YouTubers that make those copy and paste videos of anime characters having black Air Force energy, you know, mix in some black slang. What does it mean to spin the block? To do a lap around the block? A sprinkle of little ignorance there. What the fuck is this giga nigga? And boom bap. You got a consistent audience. Basically all of the CJ the Champ clones. And nothing against CJ's content, of course. I actually find his videos to be pretty funny. I literally set her up to get jumped. Yeah. Watched her get her ass beat, then blackmailed her right after it. Hey bro, that's kinda devious. Yes, I know. Cause I'm a devious ass nigga. Alright bro, you may be devious, but uh, you about to get jumped. <laughs> jumped? No. You see, you got it all wrong. Because all of you have fallen into my trap. I personally am about to beat all of y'all asses with no effort. <laughs> I know Cabrera! I'm an idiot! <laughs> It's all his sons that I'm a little skeptical about. But we're not here to talk about them today. For me personally, in some oonga boonga part of my brain, I know that there are no black people in this show. But somewhere deep in my soul, deep, deep in my soul, let me say that again. Deep, deep in my soul. This gang life, street life, delinquent life bullshit looks kind of raw. Let's go! You know, because it's fictional. Because when it's real, it's the worst thing ever. And y'all will forever look like clowns. So what I'm saying is that I want to know, why do black nerds think this way? Why do we find catharsis in watching 14-year-olds beat each other up? The Yu Yu shows, the rainbows of the anime world. I think a small reason of why we were so fascinated with the story of Tokyo Avengers is that deep down, either through all the media we consume or family members we see, is that young black Black men can't help but romanticize the type of gang life we've always been stereotyped for inside the states. Like, I'm gonna be real. I was a square suburban black teen. Shit, I still am. You might as well have called me Clarence because I lived at home with both parents. And Clarence's parents had a real good marriage. I mean, look, we see it time and time again, even with celebrities and public figures. Suburban black kids who didn't grow up with the same struggles as one another, wanting to fit in and feel a part of some hood colony. It's a part of our culture that some of us are naive to, but are familiar with in some way, shape, or form. And that's high key half the appeal of Tokyo Avengers for me. Just another glorification of a life I'm familiar with, since it's a prominent thing in my culture, but also something I'm absolutely foreign to. And what I obviously have to learn more about to speak about the subject. Ken Waku is the author of Tokyo Avengers. And the only reason he wrote Tokyo Avengers, it seems, is because it basically looked like he 
he wrote a dramatified sci-fi biopic of his life which is kind of funny because seeing these dudes in real life just make them look like cosplayers to me now he didn't know how to write a deeply rooted espionage crime thrillers since the time of his life that he was in the game it was like in the 90s late 80s era which is obviously a pretty different scene than 2017 or even 2005 where the show mainly revolves around timeline wise and since ken wasn't too familiar with that scene anymore that's the reason he decided on the time leaping plotline as the main crutch of the show to give him an excuse to show how he probably felt during that time nothing super malicious nothing overtly criminal just a bunch of dumbass teenagers doing dumb teen shit just to inevitably show the dark side of keeping this lifestyle too long and how cool dumb fun beating up dudes over <laughs> Talk. Getting beat up. Riding around with that on your motorcycle. We're not gonna talk about that. Inviting the wrong type of people into your group can breed corruption to something you thought would never get to. And now you're a part of the number one criminal enterprise in Japan. Which brings us to my next gripe about the show. <laughs> I always thought it was super weird how well coordinated Toman is as a middle school biker gang. We got hierarchies of power, rankings, divisions, captains, vice captains for every division, roles within that division, specific unit types for divisions. Like, what the fuck? Bro, I was playing Foursquare and getting my heart broken in middle school. Not organizing gang territory takeovers. I know for the most part, it's something I don't really understand since I didn't grow up in Japan. Nevertheless, that time period of Japan and I'm just a black guy from the United States that loves the culture. But you cannot lie to me that Tokyo Revengers sounds so fucking stupid sometimes. Because I'ma be real, if Tokyo Revengers was set in a high school or college setting, not many people would have as big of a gripes as they do about the realism of the show. Maybe. Because I have to suspend my disbelief real fucking hard to come to terms with the fact that this 15 year old can walk off a knife stab wound and walk around for a good 30 minutes after and not to mention this well he's dead so and another 15 year old can take punches from a guy where the strikes sound like fucking gunshots <laughs> The only problem with bumping up the ages of these middle school characters is that they'd have to bump up all of the 18 year olds in the show as well. And let's be real, I would not be watching this show if I saw a 22 year old beating up a 16 year old. Why are you f***ing here man? You're so old. Where's your wife? Go home to your family dude. So sadly, I feel like the offer could have made the characters older, but it would take some deeper work to make it work with this storyline. But I really feel like it can. And I'm not alone in this department. I know that for a fact. All of these kids are like 13, 14. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, why not? Why? Just make them 17. Tokyo Revengers for me felt like it was trying to, it was trying to get me the to get invested year. in the gangs and the, and the yeah. culture right. and stuff. And it's yeah. like, see. But at the same time, how are you going to make me believe that this is how 13 year old and 14 year olds react? That they like, that they drive by motorcycles and they do yeah. all this shit. And it's like, mm -hmm. but they're, well, they're willing to like rob and kill each other. Listen, I, if you made these kids 18, they can still be in school. Yeah. All of this yeah. would still make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, just, just do that. Why? Well, that's like Why? Because biker gang culture really peaked in the 80s and 90s. So the further we get into the years, the less it makes sense for this bullshit to really happen happen within the present the characters have to be young so the past storyline can take place in the 2000s right so i understand ken's decision for making the story in the way he did it does not stop my immersion from being killed though and with that let's unpack the show a little more and let me just say i rewatched the first arc of tokyo avengers and immediately remembered why this show was so initially great to me it was really the initial mystery of it all that really captivated me like I said before, I still think that the show
show looks like a C tier hentai most times. But when I was watching, you couldn't tell me shit. I thought this was the most immersive story that was airing that anime season. To be fair, it low key was. Second behind To Your Eternity, of course, but, but I'ma be real, I wasn't watching 86 or My Hero Season 5. Get that bullshit out of my face. Give me the show about middle school gang wars. It was grounded enough to make me feel like I could be on the sidelines. The drama and mystery enough was captivating to keep that binge cycle going. It was truly the simple things. Tokyo Revengers is not a super complex philosophical story. It's pretty simple in its storyline structure as well as its character motivations. So the things that really kept me coming back is the self-destructive stupidity of almost every character. Delicious trash garbage territory of bad dialogue, mediocre to borderline goofy ass character design consistency. I'm coming, Mikey! Damn, nigga, what you doing out here with all this ass? Stupid character decisions, but then can have scenes like this that remind me, yeah, I'ma keep watching this shit. But let's not get it twisted. Tokyo Avengers has some pretty shitty dialogue that truly makes me wonder how I've made it this far. What are you doing hanging around here? What? The real question is why the hell would you be showing up? Oh, hey, Mikey. Oh shit, oh shit, this is looking bad! Mikey and Draken both look pissed! This is the worst possible timing! Shit's about to go down now. I came over to see how Takemichi was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Waku has made other series. Nothing as popular as Tokyo Avengers, of course. But I might give those a try to see if this is something he's consistently known for. Because, uh, I cannot take the dialogue sometimes. This show definitely should be watched in Japanese. And since I guess I have to fucking address this. To all the people that ask me all the damn time. No. I do not watch any anime in English dub. It's all always Japanese first, English maybe. It, and it usually depends on if I think it's good enough to warn or even being given a chance. Because there are some amazing dubs out now. So let's stop acting like we're in 2010. Grow the fuck up. This sub versus dub shit is such an old discussion for me that needs to be killed at the source. It is not English voice actors fault that the anime vocal mannerisms and dialect can come off so goofy as hell when heard in your own language. That is not a fault on the actor's part. They are doing their best. It's a Japanese culture thing as well as a decision on the writer's part because we all know that Japanese people don't fucking talk like anime characters. I really only use the English clips for the videos because my main audience is English and it feels better for the structure of my videos. Y'all would not know this but it's way easier for me to edit with the dub clips than the sub clips. So yeah, take that crybaby sub versus dub shit somewhere else. I am not here for it. So yeah, season one is good. 7.5, dumb fun. Let's get to the juicy shit. Because season two is where we get real crazy. So buckle up. Tokyo Avengers Season 2 is an unhinged, stupid insanity of a season, which has officially let me know that the offer just wants me to turn my brain off sometimes and just say, fuck it. But in the first half of Tokyo Avengers Season 1, we reach a level of absurdity and stupidity that I thought this show was better than. And it all starts and finishes with our main lead, Takamichi Hanagaki, the punching bag himself. How are you feeling, girl? That was a crazy fight. Um, I'm super excited. It was really tough. It was fun. I enjoyed it. It was definitely a different ball game, but I had a blast. Now, I don't usually do my videos like this going through the entire season chronologically as a whole. My videos are usually a semi-structured mess of rants and my thoughts. But for this, we got to go bit by bit just to get the absurdity of what went on this season. Let's dive in. So season two starts with the resolution to my opinion one of the best cliffhangers of that year i'm not gonna lie one of the best parts of season one was literally that cliffhanger in the finale because as soon as kisaki said Jana, no hero. now i want more but of course, since we can't have Takamichi dying, he gets saved by... Kazutoro? Wait, huh? <laughs> so 
So you got out of prison and the first thing you do is get yourself back involved into this gang shit. Damn, the justice system really is shit. So basically the premise of season two is all about setting up what Takamichi has to do to try to change the future. Again. Which is to uncover and unravel the secrets behind the Black Dragon Gang. And immediately, I'm already disappointed. The first season ends with Takamichi getting the rank of first division captain. And I do love how he's already at odds with everybody because of his rank. Hakai ought to outrank you since he obviously has way better skills. But sadly, he's got zero interest in all that. Sounds about right. <laughs> Takamichi's a softie. I ain't gonna lie, I'm getting cooked. But I'll get back to that later in the video, trust me, it needs to be talked about. So basically, once he goes back to the past, Takamichi, while on a date with Hina, becomes friends with Hakai Shiba, one of the guys he's supposed to be looking for in the past, that is apparently involved with Black Dragon in the future. And I also love how 15-year-old Takamichi is supposed to be a, like a different person than 26-year-old Takamichi, to the point he basically is cheating on Hina every day and apparently ignores her all the time wait what happened i just i just wanted to see you that's all don't lie something happened you're not acting like yourself at all which is the reason they broke up in the first place in the original timeline but now he flashes back and they're just on a cute little bowling date hmm yeah okay that was just kind of funny to me now once takamichi befriends hakai he meets his sister yuzua and get ready to learn about them because this entire arc is basically all about them. <laughs> hey. Now you see, I'm actually glad the writer chose this art to fresh out the lives of background characters, basically. There I am, Gary! There I am! We start with a characters that we've seen before in the story but had no clue who they are really for example i couldn't tell you shit about mitsuya in season one he was there he was, he was doing stuff but i couldn't tell you a single character trait of his besides that he makes the uniforms for the gang and that he's one of the original founding members and apparently knows how to put that shit on too because damn boy i see you my problem with fleshing out all of these other characters this season have made me realize one crucial fact Mikey and Draken truly carry this fucking show. You got games on your phone? Let's all be real. Mikey and Draken's friendship and bond is the most realistic and likable thing in the show. And since they weren't really in this storyline until the end of it, just to save the day, you really start to realize how much you miss their absence. Now once we meet Hakai Yuzuha, Takamichi brings up a point to himself that I just had to laugh at. Can this guy really be the future boss of Black Dragon, like Kazutora said? <sighs> he sure doesn't look like a bad guy. Could the head of that evil Tomon really be this guy? It's just like after everything this man has already been through, how has he not come to grips with the fact that sooner or later, if someone stays in this type of environment of gang shit behavior, their actions would get more and more devilish, even if they were once innocent. Everyone has the capacity for it. It's the same conversation from Avengers Endgame. If we can do this, you know, go back in time, why don't we just find baby Thanos, you know, and... Should they go back in time to kill baby Danos? Yeah, he looks cute now, but every cute baby has the potential to grow up to be a monster. It's like Takamichi's brain just hurts me sometimes. I just can't sometimes. What? what? How can someone be a different person from when they were 15 to 28? <gasps> That's impossible! Like, come on, bro. You're older than me talking like this. So on their way back home, Takamichi and Hakai get jumped by a gang we've yet to see so far in the show, named Black Dragon. And this is where we get our introduction to our main antagonist this season Tsuki with I mean Taiju Shiba now imagine seeing this grown ass T-Rex of a teenager bulldozing down this alleyway I'm sorry even if I was Mikey in this situation and not Takamichi I'd shit my pants and I bet you they're gonna tell us he's like 15 or something watch Oh my god, fuck off. This is a grown ass man. This dude punches sounds like literal gunshots. Yeah! 
I can feel Takamichi's pain in every hit. Oh my gosh. I don't know if I can take this anymore. Are you telling me you couldn't make any of them young adults? Because every time this shit happens, my immersion in realism is shattered. All I see is tomfoolery now. <laughs> So then we get a scene of Takamichi standing up for Yuzua. But I don't know, I'm gonna be real. Look at him. I kinda wanna beat him up now too. And at this point, I know getting a gun is hard in Japan, but Takamichi gets beat up almost every episode, and it's not even an exaggeration. This isn't what Baji would have wanted to happen at all! <laughs> Sakamichi not considered it at this point. I have seen a lot of anime in my lifetime and not once have I seen a show of where the protagonist gets beat up damn near every episode. At this point we might have to smuggle in some weapons. Something. So after Takamichi's daily beating, we're alluded to some more diabolical shit going on behind the scenes of the Shiba household. But first, let's take a break and play a quick game of ranking Takamichi's outfits. Now Tokyo Revengers is notorious for having some of the sauciest of fashion for characters. I mean, just look at every manga cover. The author clearly knows how to put that shit on, which makes it hilarious that he makes his main character so dripless. Let's start with alternate timeline adult Takamichi. Okay, we got the Fugazi polo hoodie. I'm not gonna lie, I actually kind of like this. The white trim, the accessories. He kind of put this together. I'll give him an A. The outlaw fit is atrocious. Terrible. <laughs> Anyone that wears letters on their shorts, but it's not just for gym wear, should be sent to jail. B tier. Now his hair in this should make it a C, but just because of the suit, simple, clean, it's a B. Now I'm not gonna lie, the Letterman jacket is low-key his best fit. He got that shit custom too. Like, yeah. see good. That's also a cool A. All of his t-shirt fits are garbage. Give them to Goodwill. He be trying to make it work too with glasses and stuff. <laughs> Okay, what was I talking about again? So now that we know who the bad guys are, the stage has been set. And Takamichi knows what he must do. I, I think. I don't fuck, you know. <laughs> I love that this man always says that he has to... Huh? You're not that guy, pal. Trust me. You're not that guy. But he never does anything on his own. The whole point of Takamichi's character is inspiring other people to help him do what he can. He's the most regular dude ever, which makes him so endearing. His friends in season 1, half of Toman in the bloody Halloween fight, everyone during the fight against Taiju. He isn't Mikey or Draken, he can't bulldoze due to competition. First he has to fail at Talking no Jutsu, then get his ass beat after, before anything can come out of the situation. But I guess now he has more confidence in his crusade since Chifia is now in on the big time travel secret. And you would think that this would help. The more minds the better, right? But the more you pick apart this show, the sooner you'll realize that this shit did not matter. So Takamichi brings the news of Black Dragon's bullshit to the rest of Toman. And I love how serious they all are about this. These teenagers are so serious about their gang shit that it's kind of respectful. As everybody probably knows, the other day Takemichi here got beat up by Black Dragon's boss. The guy did it even though he knew Takemichi was a captain in Toman. Which means Black Dragon has declared war on us. Dun, 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 dun. Now the whole crutch of this scene is that Takamichi needs to prevent Hakai from leaving Toman so the future he saw doesn't come to pass. And beforehand, Chifia and himself came up with a plan for this very situation, which made a fact all too clear to me. The offer gave his two most brain dead characters the knowledge about time travel. <laughs> oh god. Oh. The key here is Mikey. Mikey alone will make the decision, and if he says Hawkeye's not quitting, then Hawkeye's not quitting. Yeah, okay. So our plan A is to hit Mikey in his biggest weakness. Mikey, listen! Mm. I think we should all chill out and think this over, and have a bite of this. You know you love it! Here you go! 
If you don't get that bullshit out of my face, bitch. Imagine you're in a World War II meeting and one of Hitler's top generals tries to bribe him with a snack. Yes, that was their plan. I'm actually really glad that they can take Mikey's character serious sometimes, especially considering that the English dub voice actor from Mikey actually sounds badass. I wanted to kill you. <laughs> Even back then, as soon as you had been let out of juvie, I started thinking about killing you. It was my fault, was it? And the one who always kept talking me out of it was Bonji. Mikey's childlike personality mixed in with being the most dangerous person in every room always makes him dynamite every time he's on scene. And this scene really made me realize that despite his childish behavior, something that he's shown to be a defining characteristic and flaw for himself. What? <laughs> <laughs> but Mikey never messes around when it comes to the members of Toman, something that he's also shown multiple times. <laughs> he gives mostly everyone by whatever position they're in in the gang the utmost respect and I really like that for him. It shows a sign of good leadership. But now that bribing Mikey didn't work, Mitsuya saves this awful ass plan by showing us just how deep his relationship is with Hakai, which basically serves also as a fleshing out for Mitsuya more, as well as Hakai. Two brothers with siblings that they want to take care of. One who does it amazingly, and another who folds under the pressure of protecting his sister from their abusive brother, to the point that he lets his sister take his ass whoopings for him. Ah, you just gotta love classic anime, right? Zero parents or adults in the household. Mom and dad is either dead or just never around. Even behind a broken household where an older sibling is free to physically and mentally abuse their younger siblings into submission. Classic, classic anime. Now I actually really like the reasonings for Hakai's ambitions to kill Taiju. It's grounded in reality and it makes sense considering the circumstances. Cause I low-key agree with him. Bro gotta go. これは<笑> Hey everybody, today I'm going to offer up five ways to know that you need to get back in therapy. Which makes it even more funny that despite being a terrible person, the offer decided to make Taiju a loving and devote follower of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's done miracles on me. I guess Sundays are the one day he exempts from beating ass and abusing his siblings. Now that that backstory is out in the open, we get to a scene from Mikey and Michia that I really like, simply because it fleshes out Mikey a little more. Mikey. <laughs> As frustrating as it is, you have to realize that Mikey is only 15 by this point in his story. And he's already seen one of his friends murder his brother, one of his other best friends go to prison, Draken, who's basically his soulmate, almost die, and his childhood best friend for so many years actually does die, along with being the leader of the number one gang in Tokyo. So this scene was very important for me to understand where Mikey's head at was at this point in the show. Showing off that he's having sort of an awakening or a realization it feels like. It's such a short scene, but it's a prelude to what eventually does happen later on this season. I think we all know. It's like basically, I started this with my homies because I wanted to build something revolutionary with my homies that all my new homies can do hood rat shit together in. I want to do hood rat stuff with my friends. But now that half of my old homies are dead or in jail, I'm starting to forget why I even made 
lead this gang in the first place. So after those two ditched the captain meeting, we found out that Draken is vetoing conflict with Black Dragon to res respect the truce apparently between Black Dragon and Michia, which is pretty funny considering what happens later. But we'll get to that soon. Because now we have to focus on the next string of dumbass Takamichi decisions. Whee! Number one. Trusting Kisaki. I don't understand why you even did this to yourself. This made you look so fucking stupid. This shit make you look so stupid. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But after everything that's happened, why would he think that Kisaki's intentions wouldn't be anything but deception? Uh, he's got a point. This is the shit that turns my brain into mush. Oh look, another childhood flashback. Let's see. Let's see what's about to go on in this one. <laughs> Now let me say this, if I can give Tokyo Avengers one thing as a story, is that it is completely, and I say completely, unpredictable. I can never ever guess where this show might go, which heightens my enjoyment. In the finale of season 1, Kasaki calling Takamichi his hero was the biggest what the fuck moment I've had in the show that year. So of course I was interested to see if we were eventually gonna peel back the layers to why Kasaki does what he does at all in the story. But to be honest, being given more context just made me even more confused. So apparently Kisaki and Hina and Takamichi all roughly know each other and are all like kind of childhood friends? Acquaintances? Okay, so Kasaki and Hina we went to school together, but Takamichi didn't. Okay, okay. I guess because Takamichi stood up for Hina, even though Kasaki wouldn't, made him gain some type of respect for him, I guess. But it's just like, really? And that's the reason? No way. You gotta be fucking with me. We saw that in class, Hina was the only one that ever talked to him in elementary school, I guess. Which makes you think, but then why in the future is he constantly asking for her death? Meep, meep. <laughs> First, I thought it was going to be some shit like, Man, oh, you stole my girl? Well, if I can't have her, no one will. Some dumb shit like that. But I don't know. I guess we still gotta wait and see. I like that Kasaki before the drip is already like over life. I mean, I'd be stressed too if I was doing a quadratic equation in fifth grade. Like, what is that? And I know that the offer keeps stressing the fact that Kasaki's IQ is on another level than these delinquents, even when he was young. So it really just makes me think, how does Takamichi compete against someone that will always mentally have his number? Because even if these two basically have the same physical attributes, Kisaki will always come out on top because he's just simply smarter than Takamichi. This story is mainly a battle of wits. Where our protagonist has to go up against gang shit like Yagami, but will always fall flat because he's just Takamichi. Yo, tell me why this entire time I have been unaware of how old Kisaki actually was. So I Google this shit, right? Thirteen. In the 2005 past timeline shit. So that means this 26 year old man mentally has been getting outplayed, bamboozled, run amucked upon, and led astray by this three eyed 13 year old boy. 13, bro! 13! Which leads. And to our next part, this one's gonna hurt. Let me start this by saying that despite his flaws, I do think Takamichi is a very endearing protagonist. Yeah, it's probably because I'm a Naruto baby and I love a good underdog story. They will always have my heart. So seeing Takamichi get his ass beat in this flashback, shaking in his boots, really reminded me why this character is worth rooting for. It's hard to hate him completely. He's a little guy that looks out for people way stronger than him. It's got Kinda of funny. Just like look at him. Someone be his friend. But that still doesn't make up for what comes next. Brace yourself. So basically Takamichi has a conversation with Hina's dad and is told 
to stop seeing Hina. What do you even say to your girlfriend's father? I should have had a speech or something ready for this moment. I'm 26 and I feel like a nervous little kid. And I actually really like this scene because the dad actually took the time to sit down and have a conversation with him before judging him off his appearance or what he hears about him. He doesn't want him to leave Hina because he thinks he's not good enough for him or he's not a good person. It's only because the shit that he's involved in it could potentially get her hurt or worse. And to be honest, this is a fair claim. Sakamichi can't have his cake and eat it too. This whole thing started because he didn't cherish the relationship he had with Hina in his original, original timeline. He grew up, became a bum, and is now so deep into the gang life that if I was Hina's dad and I saw the boy my daughter was dating walking around like Jesse Pinkman, I don't know, I wouldn't want her to date him either. But that's not the problem here. The problem I have here is that yes, Takamichi has put her in the crosshairs of gang violence multiple times. And if she dies in the past, then the whole reason we're here doesn't matter. I get the father's point. What I don't get, but what I don't get is why Takamichi would still go along with it when he's seen the fucking future. One, you still haven't found out the reason why she even keeps dying in the first place. The future version of herself literally told you she was so sad after all those years you were broken up. Even now, I still can't forget about him. Huh? Why did I get dumped? I still don't understand. I don't know either, bro. And damn, that's actually really crazy. 10 years hung up on Taka Mickey Mouse Hanabachi? Damn, I need me a Hina Tachibana for real. Because whether or not you stay together with her in the past, still does not matter. Since you've seen two possible futures where you broke up, went on to live separate lives, and she still dies. Remember? Remember the reason you're here, Takamichi? Hello? Anybody home? Hey! So I lied. This motherfucker can have his cake and eat it too. Simply because he has to. Why would breaking up with her sooner change anything that'll happen in the future? Like medically speaking. Are you stupid? Especially the way he did it. I'm sorry, and I know you're wondering where this is coming from, but I've been thinking about it for a while now. It's because I think I might like someone else. Yeah, that's it. I like someone else, yeah. Oh, brother, I can't take this. Takamichi's decision-making sometimes just hurts me physically. The pain has gotten physical. My tummy hurts. No 26-year-old can be this stupid. Breaking up with her literally does nothing towards the future. So why did you still do it? Did you forget? I forgot about She's happier with you than without you. And what did her dad say? I only want Hinata to be happy. And the fact that he lied to her on top of it, when he didn't even have to, just grinds my gears even more. He literally didn't even have to lie. He didn't have to do it. He just hurt her even more for no fucking reason. All you had to do was say, Hey Hina, your dad said we should see less of each other. Since you know, I'm into some pretty dangerous shit that might get you either hurt or killed. So until then, I still want a relationship with you, but not until after everything. Simple simple shit. Did the author just forget that Takamichi is 26 mentally? He must have because I never seen someone his age with knowledge about the future no less perform as badly as he does. Fully functional adult brain here. This moment just felt completely contrived for pointless melodrama that the story had already presented to us with two separate future timelines no less showing that breaking up with Hina does not matter. She still dies. So why make him do it? Why make him do it in the present? Why? Hello? Knock knock Kenny. Are you still there? Bro, is everything good? Was everything good while making this? Were you drinking enough water? You are in the middle of writing a story, please. Please make it make sense. Takamichi completely deserved to get folded by Hina. It's like, I don't even care anymore. It's numbing, bro. Bro gets his ass beat as an adult, as a kid, 
by thugs, by his friends, by his girl, on a train, in a plane, I'm going fucking insane. The writing on this grown ass man is abysmal sometimes, because yes, he is portrayed as kind of an incel, but even incels have common sense. Because you know what show portrays a 25 something year old incel that did nothing with his life originally and now has another chance to do things better? I don't know, it's a little show I just talked about, a little ditty, go watch that if you haven't already. The main character in that show is a pretty awful person in season one but at least he still acts like an adult inside the body of a child god really gave time travel powers to the dumbest motherfucker alive because at this point bro he might as well just go back to the future and just live your life the way it is because you clearly have lost too many brain cells getting beat up at this point so while watching this train crash of a decision i was praying for them to inevitably go back on this eventually which they do end up doing fantastic this was a huge waste of my time so it's like i don't know good job i guess fuck but it's just like why even include it in the final draft i don't see the point comment down below if you do because i don't see it i just don't know anymore man i like how kid takamichi is a better fighter than teenage takamichi when he's gonna pull out some of those drop kicks there's a big fight coming up that i think he'd uh you know need it for so now that i've taken the time to highlight another dumb storyline of the season so far let's talk about something good we get to see Bob again and I really like how nice the sound design is here you can hear every step of him getting off the bike yeah that's all the that's all the good stuff I had let's get back to the dumb stuff now the show always wanted to make me believe that Baji and Chifia were such good friends but I'm sorry I'm not feeling it I never felt it. If my friend beats the shit out of me with a Jimmy Hopkins mount just to assert dominance in our middle school gang, my respect would be gone for him. I would feel some type of way about it. I never see Mikey beating up his friends like this. And this moment is supposed to be an interlude to Takamichi getting Baji's captain slash. And see, I would think this would be a cool moment for our man's Takamunchi. I would. I, I, I would think that. But bro hasn't made a single good decision so far this season to garner why I believe that he can lead a whole battalion of people as their captain. His position already has a Mickey Mouse asterisk above it. <laughs> Let's not get it twisted though. Takamichi is not a weak person. He's just surrounded by inhuman monsters that make him look weak by comparison. His fight against his bully in season 1 was pretty cool. It was the first time he showed some real fighting prowess. Because his fighting level is the same level as a housefly. While his durability and endurance is cockroach level. And that's the real thing the author wants us to see about him. But it's just like for me. All the characters love to compare him to so Shinichiro. Oh you remind me so much of Mikey's big brother. Shinichiro, just straight yapping. Takemichi, you know, in some ways, you're a lot like Shinichiro. Truth is, you remind me of my older brother. He's dead now. Hey, man, I'm sure your brother was a great guy. Um, That's unfortunate, you know what I mean? Rest in peace to bro. Every time they say that and they show a flashback of Shinichiro, it's a contradictory for me. Because Shinichiro is, yeah, shown to be a goofy, non-coordinated guy, the same as Takamichi. But he's never shown to be crying and flailing about or looking as stupid as Takamichi does. To the point that I'm like, who would ever follow this man into battle? Let alone give him the position to lead a bunch of people. That's why I feel what he did at the bloody Halloween fight did not truly warrant a captain position for me inside the gang i'm open to a conversation about this in the comments be nice down there this is a safe debate space so now that we got through that we finally reached the climax of this season which starts off with takamichi trying to talk no jutsu hakai to not kill his brother since you know it'll make him go down a dark path in the future now at first i was completely on the side of stopping him from catching a body until he said this if he doesn't like the food he punches me if i forget to greet him the right way he forces me to kneel in the corner all day if i'm not up in the morning before him he kicks me until i cough blood when he's in a shitty mood, he kicks my ass just for looking at him. Did you get the picture? Don't talk to me about my family because you have no fucking idea! <laughs> hmm. 
I see your point. Okay, on second thought, maybe, maybe this guy actually has to go. You know what they say, if it's your time, it's your time. Now after Takamichi realizes that his last name isn't Uzumaki, we cut to see, oh look, Kisaki betraying them. What a surprise! Another W decision by Takamichi Hanagaki. Putting any ounce of trust into the man that is literally the cause of everything that's going on. That was the plan. Not a great plan. Now as we go into this confrontation, while I was watching, I couldn't help but ask myself. Watching Taiju pick up a bunch of pews with one hand and throw them like he was a fucking metahuman. You know, who is watching the church on Christmas? But then I thought, <laughs> silly me. There are no adults in this show. Let's move on. Now as this fight ensues, it really keeps you on your toes with how chaotic it gets. First Yuja tries to stealth kill Taiju and fails. Takamichi then figures out why Hakai goes bad in the feature. And then, oh shit, Michi is here? Okay. Wait, what? Where did he just- Jesus Christ. How did he even find out that everyone was here? Nobody else knew that Taiju was gonna be at the church on Christmas. Did Kisaki tell him to come like he did with Yuzaha? Did Chifia? No, couldn't be that, cause he's still tied up. And it doesn't help that while watching this fight, how cool it probably would have been if it was just handled by another studio. No! Not you! Give somebody else a chance. I love how Chifia and Takamichi just have a full conversation while Michia's clearly getting his shit rocked. They whooping me! <laughs> they whooping me! Uh, don't worry guys. I, I, I think Michia needs help, you know, but yeah. Take your time though. I, I, I think he's slowing him down. Look, <gasps> Sats. I don't even know, I don't even know what to say anymore. These kids are not human. How is he conscious after that? Take him to the hospital. Takemichi, Chihuya. Wh 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 why are they talking again? Why are they just letting them talk? Aren't we in the middle of a fight? The tension is just out of the window now. What is happening? You think that after all of this chaos, one of you, at least one of you, would be like, hey, let's call Mikey before one of us fucking dies. You, you you guys, you know, one of you called him, right? Mikey and the others will be here soon. We just have to hold out till then. With those guys on our side, the tables will turn. <sighs> Takemichi, did you, did you call Mikey? Huh? I thought you called him, didn't you? Die. Yeah, these are some dumbasses. We're doomed. And that sucks, because the overall theme of this arc while staying true to the main goal of the show on paper isn't bad. Like I said before, I like that the arc is building rapport around new characters and exploring characters that we already know. It just feels so clunky. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Jesus. Not even you can save him this time. It's like at this point, how has nobody, especially Takamichi, not developed some sort of brain damage, CTE, or something from all of these weapons? I can truly see why people think Takamichi getting his shit rocked, but being so hard-headed that he keeps getting back up to a point where it's commendable for taking these sonic boom-ass punches is worth praise. I, I see it. My only question is, what does he plan to accomplish? Um, uh, I'm really not sure. Taiju isn't just gonna give up and say, Damn, bro, you really, you really took those punches. I guess I gotta get- No, no, no! He's not gonna give up that way. Let's be real with ourselves. You just have to keep asking Takamichi, what is the plan? What are we doing? What is the end game? It's like I'm convinced his body based off his choices and actions this season is just running off pure muscle memory and his brain got knocked out a long time ago. I wouldn't be so hard on the man if this wasn't our protagonist with the ability to see into the future. Bruv's head is straight empty up there. Watching Takamichi get hit with a 50-piece combo no-sauce was never 
that cool to me. Especially since this was coming out the same time as Vinland Saga Season 2, with the main character in that show doing the same shit Takamichi did, but it was way more badass and well done, simply because the main character in Vinland Saga, Thorfinn, doesn't get beat up as much as Takamichi. Thorfinn is literally letting himself get beat up for a specific reason, even though he can fight back, while Takamichi has no other way of fighting back. Thorfinn's moment is the cultivation of a beautifully written character arc, while for Takamichi, this is just another fucking Tuesday. I know the whole point is to give Hakai the courage to fight his abuser, but at this point, just give Yuzuha Hakai's position inside the gang, because at least she has put in more work at this point in the fight. Shit, if you want to be real, Yuzuha has put in more work this entire season, considering she was the one to take all of Taiju's beating in place of Akai. Like, why did they show her dead mom, like, coming to ghost hug her in this very moment? Like, like, yo, mom, how about instead of hugging me, how about you go back in time and hug Taiju before he becomes an asshole? That would very much help. I think we would have a better life because of that. And it doesn't help that this man is, like, an absolute unit with three health bars in this entire fight. Basically, 1v5 and with a knife wound in his side and still whooping so much ass. This entire fight was not badass to me was the equivalent of watching the Z fighters getting their shit kicked in, waiting for the main character to come, but instead of Goku being the main character, Yamcha is. We've literally been waiting for Mikey to arrive like a damn Dragon Ball Z character this entire time. I had no faith, no faith that Takamichi was gonna pull something out of his ass in this entire sequence. This entire fight was supposed to be badass, but it was honestly just pathetic to me. Coupled with the the fact that the animation isn't the nicest to look at. I truly feel like this could have been done better. But hold your horses. The buffoonery doesn't stop there. So once Mikey pulls up, he immediately ends all of our torture by one-shotting Taiju. Huh? How you get knocked out off screen while being on screen? I'm dead. I also love how the show loves to remind us that Taiju is in fact a middle schooler. Please stop reminding me. This is not a middle schooler. This is a homeowner with two kids and a mortgage. Please stop telling me that information. So after Taiju wakes up from Mikey's one shot kick, he tries to call on all his troops that were waiting outside the church this entire time only to find Draken. And oh my fucking god. Draken. Ken Ryuji. By himself. Beat up a hundred people. Let me say it again. By himself. What? What? This is when I caved in. This has to be the stupidest, the dumbest thing I have ever seen. And at this point, I'm along for the ride. Logic is out the window. You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. Let's just enjoy the chaos at this point. Because we truly need power scaling on Draken. Where the fuck is Swag Hage when you need him? Because if Tomon was so hesitant to go to war with Black Dragon, but Draken single-handedly took out a hundred of their weak-ass gang members, what was the worry? Why did we need a truce in the first place? This conclusion is so fucking stupid. The best thing about this conclusion to this arc is obviously Yuzuha's talk with Taiju, saying how she still loves him even after after everything he put them through. You chose to act like you were alone all that time. And I was the same. I thought I was all alone. And that's just the way our family is, right? I hated you so much that I wanted you dead. And yet I love you. <laughs> It's really interesting to see a character still have love for their abuser because they know what happened to make them reach this state, which makes the story of their family all the more sadder. What I didn't like, however, was this. Mikey, Draken, it's thanks to you two that we beat Black Dragon's ass today. But the real hero in this victory 
is Takemichi. <laughs> you know what? Now originally, I was done. This video somehow took me two months to make. You guys didn't deserve this long of a wait for Tokyo Avengers. I'm so sorry. I had multiple videos planned for the rest of the year that all have to get put on a back burner because of fucking Tokyo Avengers. Because originally, this video was going to end here. I was gonna cover my thoughts on season one and season two and I was done. Boom, here, take it, damn. But now that I have some time and I have officially watched season three of Tokyo Avengers as well as the second half of season two because originally i i just stopped i couldn't do anymore we are now about to go over this little epilogue chapter of for season two as well as the tenjuku art of season three and oh boy god damn this is a long ass video strap in <laughs> okay now before we actually talk about season three we have to talk about this little epilogue that wrapped up season two because i actually never finished season two which basically revolves around takamichi thinking he did it we're we're, we're good we're good now right but before we get to that we for some reason get a mitsuya backstory about how he met draken for the first time and i'll be honest random as fuck but I actually really enjoyed it. You won't realize it, but as of right now, the Tokyo Avengers cast is absolutely bloated in terms of characters we have to focus on and care about, which makes it cool to show everyone's own specific reasonings for being friends. It fleshes out the characters really well. Everything feels connected in terms of character relations. I'll give Ken that. While he was writing this, he made sure that everyone has their own specific dynamic with each other mikey and draken takamichi and mikey mikey and hina hina and emma takamichi and draken draken and mitsuya mitsuya and hakai hakai and takamichi takamichi and emma emma and draken takamichi and kasaki kisaki and hina even have a past together i really like that but now finally after everything, Mikey finally, with evidence of Kisaki being a snake, kicks his ass out of the gang. And originally, you know, you would be happy about that. But then, Mikey goes and invites the former members of Black Dragon into the gang. Why they go and do that? And I'm just like, Mikey, my dude, what is with you allowing turncoats into the gang? These guys are completely untrustworthy at this point in the story. Yeah, yeah, it all turns out good in the end. But like I said, Draken whooped a hundred dudes at once. Are y'all really in need for that much help? No wonder the gang goes to shit in the future. We just be letting anybody up in here. I did really like seeing Mikey get Takamichi his own bike, even if this motherfucker never drives it. You really know the extent of how much a person values your relationship when your friend is making you a gift out of nowhere, let alone fixing you up a whole bike. Really cementing the seed that Takamichi is really viable to Mikey as a friend, which will be important for his mental health moving forward apparently. And I said this before, yeah, yeah, Takamichi reminds him of his brother. But I don't know, bro. You have a sister and a couple of best friends that you've known your whole life. But yeah, the guy you just met a couple months ago, having him be in your life just because he reminds you of your dead brother is the end-all, be-all relationship to murdering all of your other friends? Also, I'm kind of sick right now. If I sound like shit, that is why. So once Takamichi returns to the future, he finds himself at a funeral. Luckily, this time, it's not Hina's. It's Mitsuya's. Oh. <laughs> okay. Now, at this point, if I'm Takamichi, and I've done all this for my girlfriend to be alive in the future, the thing I was trying to fix in the first place, yo, I'm sorry, Mitsuya. You might have to take this L, bro. My mission is complete. Because at what point will Takamichi just go, you know, bro, I don't even know anymore. I feel like I get a W and immediately come to the future to get my ass slapped with an L. I can 
not win. Mikey murdering all of Tomon's captains was pretty shocking, I'm not gonna lie. Like I said before, you stay associated with gang shit for too long. Baby Daniel's theory, you, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, you get it by now. At this point, I just spent around like 30 minutes to an hour shitting on Takemichi's decision making. But I don't know, man. I'm really empathizing with him here. After you left, Tomon changed into something different. Huh? Takemichi. <clears throat> what was it that made you leave the gang? Hmm? He can't really account for what his future self will do once he time leaps. So like I said before, the only outcome I see for the story of Tokyo Avengers for Takamichi to get his happy ending is reliving his life in the past completely to make sure your past self doesn't fuck up everything by randomly leaving the gang for a reason they never explain. Making sure that no corruption keeps happening within it to warn her a bad future. But you know, something's been kinda bugging me about the storyline. Something pretty stupid. No, not, not, not him. Why did Chifia let Takemichi leave the gang since he's supposed to be watching his past self while he time leaps? Um, well, it doesn't have to... That's a good question. I don't know. You know, since he's the only person that knows he's a time traveler. Oh, let me guess. Kind of forgot about... My only answer to this is that... I guess Chifia didn't know or understand Takamichi and Mikey's relationship enough to know how much that would hurt Mikey with him leaving the gang, which is fair. Mikey usually talks to Takamichi in private, but still kind of fishy, I don't know. I do like how everyone gets to die differently. Chifuyu Matsuno, shot and killed. Hakai Shiba, burned to death. Takashi Mitsuya, strangled. Ken Ryuguji. Stabbed to death. But Hanata still keeps getting hit by a fucking car. <laughs> now look, Mikey's messed up mental state is alluded to multiple times in the show. So Mikey killing everybody isn't out of nowhere, obviously. This timeline was always one of the many possibilities. He's always on the verge of killing somebody because of how they wronged him in some way. Along with the weight and expectations of leading the biggest gang in Tokyo, you know, it sounds like a rough job for a fucking 15 year old to have. It's no wonder bro goes insane in one of the worst timelines yet. See, a lot of people say that the show would have been better if it was just following Takamichi and Toman growing up. And me being an advert hater of reincarnation plotlines, you would think I would agree with this. Telling this story chronologically would ruin so much of the best things about the mystery allure of the show in the first watch. It can be done, don't get me wrong. I just don't know if the quality will be as good as the product we've already been given already. If I had to guess, I feel like Ken wanted to tell this story in this way for a specific reason. And well, at least the season ends the same way as it begins. A face off between our main hero and villain. It's not as impactful as season 1, but after the bullshit that was this season for me, I can at least say after watching season 3, at least it can't get any worse. Okay, we can talk about season 3 now. So season 3 picks up right where season 2 does, of course, and already I am rolling my eyes because good god these gang rankings are so fucking stupid. Tokyo Manjikai. Like bro, you're in middle school, shut your ass up. Going into this season, I heard a lot of good things about this season. A lot of big talking from Tokyo Avenger fans that this will be the best season of the show so far. And well, you guys were wrong, but that's okay. It's at least better than season two. Because as far as the overall narrative goes, we're still doing the same thing. A new gang forms because of Kasaki. New strong guys, internal family, friend, drama, and of course, Kisaki is behind it all. Yo, I really, I really can't stand this motherfucker. <laughs> Bitch ass. And at this point, has Takamichi not considered killing Kisaki? Even worse! I know Kasaki's little infatuation with getting close to Mikey is explained later on, and trust me, 
we're talking about it but sometimes it's just like bro get off his nuts Oh, and hey, new character. He's gonna get the best looking fight scenes from now on. His whole thing is being angry while being the nicest guy ever. And his brother smiles while being... You, you get it. It's not that complicated, really. I love how they just come in and start crippling people with a whole motorcycle. You're telling me he didn't kill or severely injure anyone here? He literally runs over this dude's spine. He is killing them! Now, remember how I said angry gets all the best looking fight scenes from here on out well i'm not lying his fight scenes are the best that this show has looked since episode 9 of season 1 wow hey that's pretty good so yeah unfortunately everything i said earlier in the video is true there was no significant increase in how the show looks animation wise and sadly that's very disappointing disappointing enough to almost sick me out of the whole season and now once again our hero takamichi has to figure out what the fuck is going on again why is there a new gang who is their real leader but me as the viewer i'm not even thinking about that anymore the real mystery of the show is who the hell is the tailor for all these kids none of you have any jobs they say that coco was brought in to bring money but how are they going about doing that i wish that was like shown i don't know so while takamichi and tiffy are trying to figure out who the bad guys are again takamichi comes to the realization that <gasps> what if Kisaki is also a time traveler which to be fair is not a terrible assumption considering this 26 year old man keeps getting skadoodled in every calculated way imaginable by a 13 year old and then after that everything just goes into straight chaos looking back i almost forgot how chaotic the first episode of season 3 was mitsuya acquires another head wound I'm not gonna lie, this almost made me turn the damn show off. You guys almost didn't get this video. This is getting insane. How durable does the offer want me to believe these middle schoolers are? Mitsuya is dead. Period. So that stupid ass scene aside, it's a real funny seeing actual gang behavior going down for once. Tenjuku has no morals. People are getting jumped, beaten to shit. And of course, there is no police no adults so once takamichi gets all his bearings and finds himself in another quinky dink why am i talking like this he runs into his old childhood friend kakucho who wants to fight him first because of his first division captain rank little does he know that takamichi got that rank off of talk no jutsu credentials it's real unfortunate that the offer wants us to feel like takamichi earned this when i just can't do it i'm not buying the stock and just like clockwork wait Wait. No way. Suicide. Oh shit! He got it. I was no. I just. I just. It's just been. A, it's been a long fight. It's been a long fight, and I just had to have a warrior spirit, and that's all. Kakuta. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I knew it was too good to be true. I just had to celebrate something, you know. Meanwhile, the main antagonist of this arc is making himself known to the real main character of the show. It's like, I don't know, he either like, I guess just wanted to meet his brother for the first time, I guess. And once Takamichi finds out what potentially will happen, bro actually uses his head and decides to use his power strategically to go back to the future to see how the next upcoming fight will pan out as you can see i clearly cannot take this show seriously anymore but i have to admit with every ounce of respect i've lost for tokyo avengers they make it up this season a little with the raising of the tension at some point in the show i'm genuinely scared that one point in time takamichi is just gonna travel back to the future and just be in jail with no way to get back but once he does get back to the future naoto says the one thing that every Tokyo Revengers viewer has had on their mind since episode 1. KILL HIM! Because come on, why does Takamichi of all people have a heroic no-kill rule? Yeah, I know he's just a normal everyday dude, but like, there's no way it's not on the table at this point. This man is a murderer to the highest degree that is better off in the dirt. 
Now I've always enjoyed how this show unravels its mystery of what's happening. It's one of the main reasons I enjoyed season 1 so much. It's the shit that goes on while Takamichi is just bumbling through trying to fix everything that's so funny to me. Like bro learns some information and then just walks outside talking about I'm gonna go investigate. <laughs> like bro, investigate where? You have no location. You have no address of these criminal affiliates. It's like the crime espionage aspect of Tokyo Avengers is cool until you remember that this all started with middle school gang fights. Because then everything just starts to feel stupid again. Because sometimes it's just really really hard to imagine that these kids would be living this type of life until their late 20s. And so of course everything goes wrong again for Takamichi. <coughs> Next. He gets shot and barely gets out of this situation alive. And unfortunately, since I already know that Naruto will come back to life, because duh, I just can't help but feel nothing for this scene. Yes, very sad. Anyway. I didn't expect season 2 of Tokyo Revengers to leave that much of a bad taste in my mouth that it's hindering my experience of season 3. Because to be honest, all it did was push the flaws of the show to the forefront of my eyes. Because good god, this show loves a good twist. Whoa! Mikey has an adoptive brother we've never known about cuz... He kind of forgot about... He kind of forgot about... He kind of forgot about... What do you mean? He kind of forgot about... What do you, what do you he mean? Kind of forgot about, he kind of what do you forgot mean? about... At least this moment gives a birth to one of my favorite Takamichi scenes to date. So after watching another person die, we get to see Takamichi at his lowest. And I'll be honest, this scene is honestly pretty scary. And that's what makes it work. Most of the time, Takamichi is either looking pretty pathetic, but this time it's haunting how much you feel the dread within the reality of the situation. Bro has no clue how to make sure Naruto is alive when he goes back into the future. So that safety cushion he's had this entire time is gone. He still has no clue how to save Hina, it's all just a big mess and I honestly feel it in this scene. Yeah, it's weird that Hina just like believes Takamichi is a time traveler. I didn't really expect that. Even Mikey and Draken believe it too at the latter half of the season. Because like, yeah, we've always been told that 26 year old Takamichi acts differently than 14 year old Takamichi, but like, how differently really? How differently really to believe something as wild as time travel. But I don't care anymore. If the local juice hasn't been drunk yet, you know for sure now how far gone from realism we are in this story. So after Takamichi gets his conviction back, he goes to see Mikey at his house. Which is actually a really cool scene. Since Mikey is the best thing about this show, learning the little things about him that we don't get to see because we have to follow Takamichi the whole time is really worth the wait. Like how he still keeps his baby blanket. I really like how Draken is the one that always does his hair every day in the morning showing off just how close they are to each other and we already know that he grew up training in his grandpa's dojo and was a prodigy which is why he can do stuff like this and to be fair mikey forgetting that emma ever told him about their adoptive brother is pretty in character like a hundred percent in character it's not a daenerys situation where she forgot about something so important not because it was in character but because the writers were incompetent in mikey's case for him not to care about people he doesn't associate with regularly in his life is pretty relatable not gonna lie i do believe that this isn't something that the offer didn't just pop out of nowhere for the sake of connecting everything back into mikey's family and izana's motivations themselves are pretty clear and concise i I don't really like how the information is shown to be honest it's kind of like messily drip fed through us through like the entirety of the season but by the end of it you get the picture and once you get past his literal sins he becomes an honestly very sympathetic character nobody besides hoodlums have ever cared about this man in his entire life parents abandoned him stepmom abandoned him the foster system abandoned him mikey and emma forgot about him and the only reason shinichiro abandoned him was because the bro died <laughs> Resulting in what I see is a broken young adult failed by the world. This setup alone gave this arc a sort of final season type of feel. But since I know for a fact we still have so much source material to go through, it kind of makes me sad, I'm not gonna lie.
一番隊はどうする You see what I mean? How bro keeps saying he's gonna work on his own, but never goes through with it. I mean, I never believed for a second Takamichi would actually kill someone, but it's kind of cool to hear him say it. Oh shit, it's time for Takamichi to get beat up already? It's cool seeing Mucho out of all people being given some depth for this season, being the reason that Takamichi met Mikey and Draken in the first place, and his division unit being the one to weed out traitors is pretty cool. I don't know why he told him that just to expose himself as a traitor, but you know. I love when Takamichi gets hero music, because every time I just have no confidence that anything will go his way in this situation, or that he can get any of his men out of the situation through fighting. There's only so many never give up speeches just before he gets his shit rock that I can take. Like I kid you not, this is routine at this point. Because I will say it again, Takamichi's entire character is about rousing his troops through sheer ignorance, willpower, hopes and dreams it's just not cool bro it looks lucky he's a lucky guy i simply don't see any real person putting undying faith into a man that gets rocked every fight how can i trust him how can i completely trust him as a leader he's not a good strategist he's not a good negotiator bro is just working with head trauma and vibes i'm not going to war with you one thing that was nice about this season was giving some more characterization for emma especially her relationship with mikey like this whole time i had zero clue emma was a foreigner huh and how mikey gave himself a normal gaijin nickname just to make emma feel more comfortable living in japan ジョーから俺、マイキーになる。ほ。兄貴の俺がマイキーだったら一緒だから変じゃねえだろ。これからはずっとマイキーだ。エマ。女心分かってないな。ん名前なんて気にしてないし。<笑> That context was really nice to Mikey's nickname, I'm not gonna lie. And since the show basically revolves around Mikey, and for good reason, I mean, come on, this didn't get you hyped? いいか、お前ら。この戦い、後ろに隊長は一人もいねえ。俺だけでいい。そうだ。俺らにはマイキー君がいる。天竺潰すな。The first five episodes of season three of Tokyo Avengers completely reminds me why I ever cared about this show. I really enjoyed these characters. I really like how Emma gives context to Mikey's behavior about how he doesn't like being vulnerable since he always wants to put out I'm him energy. Tokyo Nanjikai Socho, Muteki no Mikey. Mikey wa hitomai de tsuyoi tokoro shika misenai. Aniki ga shinda toki mo. Showing how he truly can't deal with that on his own, and that's how we get the fuckboy Mikey timeline. All this characterization for someone we've only seen in a small supporting role is nice. Until you realize what it was all for. Now even though I was spoiled about Emma's death, thank you Google search, it was still really well done. And to everyone cooking Takamichi on having shit reaction time, come on, give him a break on this one. He thought Kasaki was gonna attack him, not Emma, plus the bike was moving super fast, we'll, we'll let him have this one, we'll let him live on this one. Now what I won't let slide is this. <laughs> Is this nigga serious? Takamichi, why would Kisaki give a single shit about getting innocent people involved? This isn't Breaking Bad, where if you're not in the game, they'll do everything they can to keep you uninvolved. He doesn't care. In the first arc of this show, Kisaki got Pa's friend's girlfriend beat up and R-worded. Catch up! Oh, and you wanna know another innocent girl that Kisaki has killed before? Hey, no! 
doesn't care about murdering innocents, especially women. Takamichi saying stupid shit like this aside, I did almost tear up at Mikey carrying Emma and her dying in his arms. It's actually really sad and well done. The lighting, how detailed Mikey's scrawled out eyes are, surprisingly moving. It's just really sad that you wish you'd spent more time with Emma throughout the entire series instead of bits and pieces until her eventual death episode. That's not cool. Where we get a flashback of her childhood, basically just raising her death flag to the fucking rooftops. I simply just wish we got more of her. Why did her biological mom never come back? How did she adjust to life in Japan as a foreigner in such a young age? Emma dying isn't sad because we really, really cared about her. We really just care about how her passing will affect the characters that we truly really care about. Similar to Sasha in Attack on Titan or Aunt May in No Way Home. She's one of Mikey's support pillars. First he lost his brother, then Baji, and now his little sister to the same violence. And because of his circumstances, his immediate reaction isn't gonna be to quit the gang life or anything. It's gonna be to get his lick back. We up one. Your brother dead. Come on, get your lick back. Come get your lick back. Because that's simply how he's been conditioned. Ken is trying to Jesse Pinkman Mikey, killing everybody he loves right now. And I kinda like it. So now that Kisaki is now intentionally a murderer with blood on his hands, Emma Sano, the little sister of Mikey, is dead. Which isn't reversible. And you know, just thinking about it, this all really could have been stopped by our valiant hero. If he just one, killed Kisaki, two, told Mikey to kill Kasaki. Three, told fucking anybody to kill Kasaki. <laughs> you want this man to be a gang leader? Please stop. I also don't know what Kisaki was thinking on making Izuna one of Mikey's new support pillars when Dragon and Takamichi are still alive. Especially when Takamichi knows that Izuna gave the go-ahead to kill Emma. Got Kasaki staring at the sunset and shit, admiring his work like Thanos resting on the thought of a better universe after committing murder. I just hate how initially stupid Kasaki's reasonings were for everything he was doing without context. Like he'll say dumb shit like, I'm doing everything so I can be reborn, like whatever that means. <laughs> And what the fuck is you what talking about? What the fuck was that? Man, I'm sorry, man. Sorry, man. No, I'm sorry. When you know everything about this man, it just makes it so much worse now. And the saddest part about it is how much of a victim Mikey is in this story, Loki. Everyone is always trying to use him, use his influence, use his strength. Like, bro is just trying to chill and mess around with his homies. Leave him alone. It's like easing his motivations for wanting to ruin Mikey's life are clear. Kisaki's motivations were always stupid and convoluted for me, even when you have full context of the story. But you gotta hand it to him, he did make the season more exciting, because the aftermath of Emma's death hits way too hard bruh. The animators decided to actually show up to work today and snapped out here. Mikey's done with life expression, as well as Draken's reasonings for being upset, I really loved. And I like how Draken called Mikey outside of the hospital to do this, showing how he still has respect not only for Emma, but also for innocent people as well. And it just keeps going, honestly. It's really sad to see everyone's reaction to Emma's death. It's weird how everybody's just able to walk in, though, and just look at her dead body. Oh, yeah, I forgot. There's no... There's no adults in this show, silly me. Takemichi-kun! <laughs> You just had to fucking ruin it, didn't you? 26 year old grown ass man, by the way, drawing on his fingers, making jokes, trying to help someone through grief. Like, come on, bro. Not even the teenager version of himself would act like this. I don't care about his little speech he gave after. That shit did not make Hina feel better. Can we get to the final fight, please? And now, damn near all of Toman's main players are out of commission. It is up to Takamichi and the crew to get the job done.
We are fucked. It's funny as hell even seeing the NPC members not respecting Takamichi. You know, because they shouldn't really. It makes it even funnier that the reason he even got them to come along in the first place is the end all be all classic. He's going to be that shit never fails. Now look, once again, this all comes down to Takamichi's terrible decision making and him not growing or learning really throughout the past couple of seasons. How come throughout that entire speech, when it came to getting the troops back on his side, he never mentioned once that Kisaki was the one that killed Emma. That would have immediately made everybody want to slide for Mikey's little sister. Dang Takamichi, dang! And I'm sitting here thinking, why would Tenjuku even be scared of a Takamichi-led pull-up anyway? Because yet again, it just feels like we're playing the same waiting game for Goku and Vegeta to arrive to the battlefield. Because from this shot alone, unless 10 of those dudes brought guns, we're cooked. Now once this fight actually gets on and popping, everyone from Tomon starts fighting like it's the last fight of their lives. We have Pe, yes, Pe. Oh, you an apology. I wasn't really familiar with your game, and you know how. Shifia is actually contributing again. Takamichi is. You know. Isn't that one shot's pad in the clunkiest way possible? We get context for Inupi and Coco's relationship. Two characters I didn't really care about at all until this season. You know, I just wish this backstory didn't come in the middle of your action climax. Coco dedicating his entire life to getting to the bag. I thought it would just be a gag since I don't take this show that seriously anymore. But it actually being a serious motive for paying for the treatment for Inupi's sister is honestly really sweet. Like, I never questioned that burn mark on his face. I thought it was just another cool character design. Time. Them actually showing a backstory for that really surprised me. It's like, fuck, you got me. I'm a romantic motherfucker. I love giving people you perceive as thugs at first a noble reason to want to turn to a life of crime. Coco actually becoming one of my new favorite characters of this show from his backstory alone. Now, besides the inconsistencies of the animation, everything was living up to the hype so far. Izuna gives a speech showing off that these dudes are in fact criminals and not just teenagers doing dumb stuff. Excuse me, why? The Haitini brothers that have been hyped up since season one are actually cool and lived up to the hype, with one being an MMA fighter and the other having killed a man at 13 years old. I mean, that's not really in that of an impressive feat now, but you know. Bro! Hakai is dead! Like brain damage? Something? Let's all just sit and watch this happen. I, I understand. He'll, he'll probably like... He'll, he'll probably be fine, you know? I, I get it. And of course, the magnum opus of this climax is angry bodying all of Tenjuku's captains. Leiden Films really pulled out the pen for angry of all people. <laughs> Mitsami. They're still doing the direct cut to KO thing that they do in every fight, but whatever. I don't really mind it that much here. I only mind it when they do it every time for Mikey's kicks, since I feel like it really lessens the aura of the kick. Sometimes it's whether or not if the shit looks cool or not. That's just how our monkey brains work sometimes. Whoa, that was cool. And even after all this cool stuff has gone down, I still can't help but feel like this is just a bunch of coincidental stuff happening that somehow ends up going in Takamichi's favor with no plan, no direction at all. This is a really weird conundrum for me. Writing a character where his only plan is to go in head first 
get beat up and get back up is of course endearing stupid but endearing it's just that because we know he has no ace up his sleeve no plan i know he'll be saved i got no coordinates no clues no strategies no options zero zip nada it ruins the tension takamichi's only hope is putting a battery in everybody else to try and win a fight he can't realistically win so when kasaki does this i got that thing on me i got that stick i got that tool i'm packing i'm just like what's next takamichi go ahead what is the plan what are we doing here and i love how all the tenjuku guys are all like whoa bro you're using guns i thought we were just gonna you know beat him up a little i think that's uncalled for man like kasaki didn't just kill someone the other day not even gonna ask where a 13 year old is getting a gun in japan but uh no there's no point in asking these questions anymore you gotta give it to kasaki though the man does stand on business and any scene kasaki has a gun bro does pull that trigger now if someone showed me tokyo avengers for the first time and it was the scene of takamichi staring down the barrel of a gun going never back down never what i would have been like oh yeah i can see why why people would follow this guy into battle that's pretty cool but when you have full access to his catalog of ass whoopings reality sets in realistically neither me or you at home or anyone in this show would really put their undying faith into someone constantly getting their ass beat. Tokyo Revengers is a comedy in disguise, and Takamichi is my favorite clown. You guys wanna see something funny I seen on Twitter the other day? They believe in him because of his drive to not give up, along with his care and compassion for others. You don't need to be able to fight well, or be a badass, in order for people to believe in you. Take MLK for example, he never fought, he only stood up for what was right, what he believed in and people believed and respected him for it. Not gonna lie, comparing Takamichi to MLK is the funniest shit I've seen in a while. Well, if we're making that comparison, his speech to Kasaki was the most gangster thing he's done since season one, so you know. I just love how Kasaki can kill an innocent girl, but not Takamichi. He had no problem with killing Emma. And despite the context you get for him not pulling the trigger on Takamichi here, it doesn't make up for it. Man, Takamichi is one interesting character. I can't tell if bro is poor poorly written or well written yeah i was cool with takamichi but you know you gotta you gotta grab the gun before he chooses not to shoot you in the foot again and now since kisaki won't kill takamichi izana comes in to do it for him and you know how i was comparing tokyo avengers to dragon ball z earlier well sometimes tokyo avengers just boils down to dragon ball z from the perspective of yamcha and krillin in my head anyways but even i can't lie mikey walking in while takamichi gives his salute was pretty hard お世話。<笑><笑> This shit means something to me, man. I hate that something can be so cliche, so predictable and expected, but when executed in a very cool way, she. You got me. <laughs> And I'm not sure what Tenjuku was thinking that Mikey wouldn't come to the fight. It's like, do you guys get how grief works? It's like, if you didn't want him to come to the fight, you should have just tried crippling him or something. Because, yeah, he'll be sad for like a minute, but then the sadness will just turn into something else. And in this case... <laughs> it turns into gratitude. <sighs> I hate that I like this stupid ass show. Wait, what? Why did you bring Hina? Bruh, if I'm talking to you, I'm like, bro, why did you bring my girlfriend to this dangerous ass gang fight with murderous fiends and criminals? Please take her home. And so now that Mikey's here and is comfortable with knowing that time travel exists, that's cool. It's time for the ultimate fight. The battle between brothers. Manjiro Sano and Izuna Kudokawa. Let's see how they do this. Ah! 
What? I'm tired of talking about the animation. I'm tired of doing it. I don't want to do it anymore. If there's one thing I hate criticizing, it's something that I would never have the complete courage to do myself. Animating for a Japanese animation company is not the job I would ever want to have. So when I say the execution of the fight between Mikey and Izuna wasn't the best, I truly mean that in the nicest way possible. Wait a minute. You. And the worst part about it is that we know that Leiden Films can produce an actually good looking fight scene if the staff and team are given enough time. Because they literally have a dope ass fight scene in the ending sequence. So to me, there is literally no excuse. I don't blame the key animators at all. If given enough time, they clearly can produce a better product than what we got. We all know it's very difficult to animate fighting, especially in the form that we've been spoiled to thanks to shows like Jujutsu Kaisen and Villain Saga and Demon Slayer, but I think I speak for a majority of the Tokyo Avengers fan base that this fight scene simply could have been done better. Frankly, Tokyo Avengers was due for a real nice Sakuga sequence. Like, you know, a little intense, well-animated back and forth for one of the biggest fights of the show so far. Like, listen, I'm always grateful for this even being animated. Lightning Films did a decent job at adapting the source material presented. But just sit and imagine. Sit and imagine if Mikey and Izuna's fight was just a bit longer considering these are the two strongest characters in the show so far. The fight with the most stakes at this point in the show. We have could have had it where the fight reaches a point that you can't even tell who's gonna win. The most euphoria I got out of this fight is Mikey's character development. If this was Mikey from season 1, he would have broke down and tried to kill Izuna the same way he almost killed Kazutoro. But because of Takamichi's influence, he chooses to try and salvage the relationship with his brother after everything. Which just makes me think, damn. I could have just read this shit. If the animation isn't gonna show up when it needs to, to incentivize a reason for an adaptation, besides money of course, Here we go. at that point, there's not much reason for me to experience the story in this way. For once, I just wanted to be wowed by a cool action sequence in this show that revolves around people beating each other up, but it's simply just not doing it for me. I'm a bit sad. Actually, I'm lying. I'm quite devastated. It's doing the bare minimum. It's decent, passable, but it feels like the studio valued manga accuracy rather than adding their own original flavor for a fight that's so needed when it comes to action-oriented shows like this. Bro, I practice martial arts. I love martial arts. Motherfucker, I'm writing an original story and screenplay about martial arts. I would have loved to see one of my favorite shows of the last couple of years display that brilliantly. But instead, I'm just disappointed. There are plenty of shows that differ away from the source material to give fight scenes some more gravitas. This could have been one of them ones. Well, now with my respect gone, Izana, you may now exit the story. Wow. Nigga, I'm going home. Still couldn't kill Takamichi though. Just gonna, you know, yeah, yeah, put that right there. Now look, I see what the author was trying to do with Izuna. I see why he is the way he is. But at this point, I just don't feel it. 
I just don't care. I am a man of emotion. You can have the dumbest plot ever, but if you make me feel something, if I have something tangible and heartfelt to take away, I will remember it. I will. But what isn't as backstory, I simply felt nothing. His motives got clearer, and I felt nothing. That's sad. I don't want to feel nothing, but I do. And that's just how it is, bruh. I guess him being like half Filipino is cool, you know? But now that Izuna is dealt with, it's time to put the last nail on Kisaki's coffin. Literally. Okay, yeah, okay. This entire chase scene is insane. I love how Takamichi punching Kisaki looks better than Izana's and Mikey's entire fight. But here we're in the final, final showdown that we have waited three seasons for. They look like clowns, but you know, it's in character. It's what I was expecting, and I'm fine with it. Even the setting of the fight is symbolic, being the place that Hina dies in that one timeline. Hina! I always thought that ever since season one, what is the reason for Kisaki to keep killing Hina in the future? What is it? Why is she always the one? Oh no. No, 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 no don't no, do no, this. No, 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 I was joking! Wait, 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 wait! So remember when I said earlier in this video, you probably don't. So remember when I said that I hope Kisaki's reasonings for killing Hina won't be a, if I can't have her, no one should love triangle bullshit. Well, yeah. He not that I really hit him with a, Ew. I mean, if you think about it, Kisaki is 13, so I guess what Ken is trying to say here is that even though Kisaki was smart enough at a young age to make a 10-year plan to become the type of gangbanging hoodlum that Hina would want to be with, simply because he saw how much she liked Takamichi, Takamichi grew up wanting to be a hoodlum, and Kisaki simply just made that his entire personality. Damn, man, pussy really is power, bro. Coochie got bro to do drive-by killings and plotting to citywide takeovers. It's like, wow, I didn't think this show would be as predictable as it was. But damn, the only thing I really couldn't predict was this. Look at his legs! <laughs> Yeah, I did not expect to offer the Isekai Kasaki. That got me. This final fight gave off so much series finale vibes. Everything being revealed, killing the endgame villain in a season that's not its final season, since I know there's more story to be told, is a very ambitious move. His death was done so well too, it was gruesome, perfectly fitting for the terrible person Kisaki Teta was. At first I thought Takamichi was gonna save him or something, but no. He just sits there and watches him die. For the first time in the show, I feel Takamichi doing absolutely nothing was the right thing to do. Him doing that actually helped someone. Bravo. Oh man. Now look, I have a lot of respect for Ken to continue the series, whether it's because he was just forced to or not by his studio, I don't really know the details. So after Kisaki's death, Kakujo wakes up from the hospital, Takamichi says his hand is itchy, and the show just ends. Say my name, I know you must have Nah, that ain't it y'all. Listen, man. No post credit scene, no wrap up episode, no prelude to the next conflict. The shit just ends. Our heroes have survived the battle with only one casualty. You know, minus Takamichi and Hakai's brain cells. And with that, good God, it's over. Now, look, I'm absolutely astonished at the emotions this show has made me feel. 
and how much I had to say about it to the point I unintentionally made my longest video ever on the channel. I truly don't know how to wrap my feelings up for this show. From the passable but disappointing animation quality to the weird character and motivations and decisions, Tokyo Revengers is an anomaly of a TV show for me. They want to be Breaking Bad so bad, killing their main villain prematurely just to introduce something again. But yeah, that's my thoughts on Tokyo Revengers. Please like the video so i can move out of my mom's house tokyo revengers the anime a mess of a show that started off entertaining and escalated into a show where the drama gives the illusion of depth but is really just entertaining dumb fun and you know what maybe that's fine who knows give it a couple years maybe another studio will pick the show up to try and do a better job or you know what they say if you want something done right, maybe you have to do it yourself. Did you tell me this was over? There ain't no use talking me over. Why can you try to tell me sooner? Why can you tell me it was over?